this is period uh, four. Today is uh, Monday, December 6th. I'm talking about the, for you guys that are freshmen, sophomores, and uh, obviously juniors, your last year to be able to apply for some of these, but um, the Kentucky Governor's Programs, there's three of them. There's GSP, GSE, GSA. I'll repeat that. GSP, GSE, GSA. All right. This is a lot of money potentially. Okay. So let's say you get into GSP. If you click on the link, you know, you'll be living on a college campus for five weeks with a lot of people your age. This year it was at Center College, beautiful college, Moorhead and Bellarmine. And you live there and they, you're typically done by like, I don't know, four or five o'clock, whatever. And, and then you have dinner. And it's like, it's literally like you're, you get a taste of the college life. You're living the college life. Okay. That's GSP. You can look on, you know, how to apply. Typically January is when you have to at least apply. That doesn't mean you got to have all of your stuff in by then, but it just means that's the deadline to apply. So you got about a month and I want to tell you about it before the deadline. Okay. Um, GSP. I think it's juniors only. I'm not sure, but so you know about it for next year, you sophomores. Okay. I'm pretty sure this one is juniors only. So you submit your stuff. It goes to the high school level first. So I'm not sure, sure who our judges are. I would assume Mr. Rowe, Mr. Zakella. I don't know, but they will pick based on the junior class size. Um, I think we normally will pick seven or eight out of the junior class. And then all of those, those seven or eight from that junior class, they send it then to the state level. And then they get picked by other judges. They sift through and they pick, you know, who they think. And if you get chosen, you're going to go live at one of these three. They have all kinds of activities and things. But these are the rewards. And this is pretty much equal for all three of these competitions. Um, is, let's see if I can find scholars, documents, resources, doesn't say what you get, scholarships. Here we go. Okay. So GSP, for example, there's a lot of schools in here. This one has the most universities, right? So like Moorhead State, Kentucky Wesleyan, EKU, Georgetown, Center, um, you have to look. They're all a little different. Uh, for example, Berea, um, if you complete, looks like they give you a $176,000 scholarship. Um, EKU, I mean, it again, it's going to depend on your GPA or your ACT or possibly both. All right. Um, but there's a lot of these. Okay. Let's go to the, no, there's Transy, there's UK. So let's see here. University of Kentucky, this is for this past year's now, is please provide scholarship opportunities to students that complete the Governor's Scholars Program. Students must apply and have qualifying academic credentials. So like I said, it's based on mostly, this one's mostly academics. Okay. Uh, by December 1st, 2021. So that deadline has passed. But again, so you guys are freshmen, sophomores. I want this on your radar for next year. Okay. Um, all awards are made based on the availability of funds and early application is strongly encouraged for scholarship consideration. Please note, applying by the December 1st early action deadline does not guarantee receipt of a scholarship. Um, so, for example, UL scholarships, there's different tiers based on your academics. If you want a full four year ride, you got to have a 3.5 GPA. Again, that's accumulative right over your three years a three five that's not that unachievable and now this is a full rides so anybody want to take a guess what is ul and uk's yearly tuition somebody guess yes you're right on right on the money you're the only one to guess that yes so uk charges around twelve thousand four hundred a year plus your living expenses those are usually around ten thousand so how much is that per year you're on the hook for? What's 12.5, let's say 12.5 plus 10? Hmm? 12,500 plus 10,000. Thank you. We'll, we'll call it 23,000. 
per year. How long are you in college, typically? Four years. Do the math on that. Let's say 23,000 times four. What is that? Close to 100,000? If it's 25,000 a year for four years, that's 100,000. So it's 90-something, probably. Yeah. So that's if you get college done in four years and you live there. Now, UK, UL, they're both about the same. They're both around the mid-12s for just for tuition. Again, it doesn't include your living expenses. Who's paying for that? Is your family paying for all that? Like my family, we have some money saved up, but not enough for my first son. We don't have enough to pay for him for everything. So, again, if you look at, so that's just, you know, it, you got to have a 3.5 and a 31 on the ACT. That's tough. That's the full ride, okay? It says tier two, if you have a 3.5 and at least a 28 on the ACT, that's 7,500 a year times four years. How much is that? That's $30,000, okay? Tier three, $5,000 a year, renewable for four years. All you gotta do is have a 3.5. That's it, no ACT required. There's also a new requirement that's not in here, which is if you have a 3.9 GPA, that's it, and you get into any of these three, full four-year ride to UK UL. 3.9, a cumulative GPA, that's it if you get into one of these three competitions. Full ride. It's like winning the lottery. Okay? I wanted you guys to know about this. So let me, I'm almost done here about this, this stuff. That's GSP. All right, the next one, GSE. This is all, you guys have seen Shark Tank? It's like Shark Tank. Basically, all you have to do is apply. A application takes 10 minutes. You will need two people to write a letter of recommendation for you. You have to make one video that is two minutes long about yourself. Maybe you have like a little side entrepreneurship that you, maybe you do like a little charity business on the side you know maybe you do a lot of charity work or community work um, maybe you have a lawn care business I don't know but they want that stuff in the video my son went to this one this year okay that's and then you have to write you have to answer there's like 10 questions you can you know you write about a paragraph on each that's it that's all you have to do two minute video Answer about 10 questions. Get two letters of, of reference. If they like it, you're in. Okay? He went through it. This one's only three weeks. He lived, this year it was at NKU. He lived on NKU's campus. And based on his, um, just all you got to do is get through. The last day, he might be in one of these pictures here. His team came in second. So they do a Shark Tank. You guys know what Shark Tank is, right? They, you, you, Pair up with a couple people. You come up with a business idea. You can mock it up. You make a PowerPoint. And you present it to the crowd. And there are three sharks up front who ask you questions at the end of your pitch, just like Shark Tank. And then they vote on their top three. The top three get money. My son's team, they came in second. Um, I was there to watch it. It was really cool. Again, it was just like Shark Tank. Great show. Um, and he made all these connections. He's got like 50, 60, 70 people on his contact list now that they've had reunions since the summer. I mean, it's fantastic. I cannot speak highly enough. And you get to live the college life for three years. You literally live there with people. And, you know, this is, I think Sanjay is his name. I remember he was in my son's class in, in his GSE, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, I, I don't want to watch all the videos, but um, but it was it was fantastic. He met all kinds of people, and he gets scholarship money. I'm not going to tell you how much, but um, it's a pretty decent chunk of money. And all I had to do, oh, there's my son right there. No way, I didn't know he was on there. I'll have to tell him today. Let me take a print screen. I'll show you. Obviously, I'm a proud dad. He's an awesome kid. That's my son right there. He's pretty tall. He's almost 6'4". I don't know where he gets his height from. It's not me. My wife's pretty tall, but he's an awesome. He's uh, And that's his good friend, Charlie. And uh, they, they grew up together. And so they were on a team of four. And their, the name of their product was, it was called Fillet. 
So, um, pretty cool idea, actually, but I won't go into all that. Um, that's GSE. You got to apply, you got to look online for when the deadlines are. Okay. That one is sophomores, juniors. So, you guys can like apply now. Okay. GSP is juniors only. GSE, sophomores, juniors. And then there's one more. Anybody want to guess what that one is? called GSA. So GSA is Kentucky School for the Arts. They're kind of three separate entities. A lot of very generous donors. Like, where's all the scholarship money come from? Donors. People donate it for this governor school program. It's been around... I didn't know about it when I was in high school. I think it might have started, like, right after I got out of high school. Um, this one, let me show you the categories so you know. If I can find it, it's a little tough to find. Our work, history, our team. Nope, that's not it. Hold on, because there's, it's not just like traditional art, if that's what you think. It's not. Um, prospective students. But I thought it was really important to take 15, 20 minutes to tell you about this stuff. Okay, so the deadline is coming up to apply soon. I'll let you look for that. The different categories. Here we go. So this is for next summer. These are your categories. There's architecture and design. There is a lot of drawing in that one, but they also like a lot of 3D modeling. So those of you guys that have done some 3D modeling, maybe in my class, IED, there you go. So basically, oh, there's also creative writing. There's dance, uh, drama. Every year we always have a couple guys I see on the list that usually uh, Mrs. Ruth, they'll get, they'll get in through drama. I think we had two this year. They got into GSA through JAMA. They're going to get tens of thousands of dollars. Um, they have, this is uh, the category that my son entered. He got into this as well. You can only get into one, though. You can't take, you can attend all three. You can't get the money for all three. You only get the money from one. But it's still tens of thousands of dollars. So film and photography, all you have to do is submit ten pieces of work. Ten. You could submit designs that you've done in my class. If you're maybe a photographer, obviously it's heavy on video or photography. Um, he does a lot of, like, he's a good photographer, so he submitted, like, four photos. You have to have one video that's, like, two minutes long, and then the other five pieces or whatever you want, for the most part. And that's the one that, and that one probably has the least amount of competition, because it's the newest category. Maybe you're into music, you're a good musician. We've had, I think we had one or two students last year that were in the band. They got scholarships through this. Okay? Then there's musical theater and then traditional visual art. Well, usually Mr. Haters will usually get some guys every year. Uh, Notre Dame included. Mr. Eckerly over there, he does a great job. Um, so this one's very competitive. This is like traditional art, you know, drawing, painting, sculpting. Um, very competitive, but if you're really good, why not apply? And then there's music as well. So there's like a lot of choices. But I wanted to tell you guys about it because you this is you should be on your radar. Okay? If if somebody asks you, where'd you hear about that? Please give them my name. Okay? Because they don't really talk about it in high school. And I think it's really important. Again, it's like winning the lottery. It's 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 huge. It's easily your biggest scholarship. Okay? Some of you guys might be like, I don't need a scholarship. My parents are going to pay for everything. Well, that's kind of like a sad, sad way to look at it, honestly. You know, wouldn't you like to help your family out? You know, it's like, it's a, again, it's like literally winning the lottery. So anyway, that's my speech about the Kentucky Governor Schools. You guys have any questions on that stuff? Some of you guys are excellent candidates. So anyway, you heard it from me. All right, that's all I'm going to say. If you have questions about it, let me know. All right, let's continue on. Um, let's see here. All right, this guy here. Again, you don't have to do any work today. We're just, just chilling and talking. All right, so again, this PowerPoint is not on the server. It's in Canvas, okay? You'll have to know these guys, just the last names, just their art movements. Don't worry about the dates. You know, when you're in college, you have to memorize all the dates. Um, if you're in the major, but just know the last names, be able to match the paintings or the work up with the artist's name. 
Okay, and then if it has an art movement, I would like you to know that. That's pretty much it. Okay, so Jackson Pollock, you might have seen his work. Some people might be like, my sister could paint that. Well, maybe. I don't know. It, it, people just either hate it or love it. Kind of the thing about Pollock, uh, he passed away, I think it was in the 70s, early 80s. Um, he was really super famous, 40s, 50s, 60s. And he was kind of known as the drip painter. His thing was all about capturing or like, you know, creating a record of his movements. If you look, there's many layers. He typically would work on humongous canvases. So they would be about the size of my projector screen there. I've seen his work. They sell for tens of millions of dollars. And again, some people were like, well, that's awful. Well, it, 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 it is what you make out of it. He's trying to tell you a story. He's recording his different movements. He does not paint with uh, the canvas on an easel like a traditional artist. He would put the canvas on the ground like you see here and then just very quickly move around and try to tell his story. So that is Pollock. There have been movies made about him. Uh, actor Ed Harris, uh, who's been in a lot of movies, he portrayed Jackson Pollock in a movie called Pollock not that long ago. Really cool movie. Um, again, if you guys have questions about these guys, let me know. Uh, Munk. It's not pronounced munch. It's Munk. You've probably seen this. This is prob. if you do most, like if you do a Yahoo, Google search, world's most famous paintings, this is always in the top 10. It's not the most famous. The winner would be always what? What would you think? What's the most, considered the most famous painting in the world? Mona Lisa, by far. Right? But this is usually in the top 10. He, unfortunately, is only known for that. He was actually a really good artist. Um, you can see the dates on this. This is a little more than 100 years ago, about 120, 125 years ago. But you can look up his work. I'm just giving you a little sample. Um, it, this painting here, he had like three versions that he did. All of these were like $100 million each and up of the three. He did like three, I wouldn't believe there was three of them that he did. And they kind of call it the Mona Lisa of anxiety. Who is this person screaming in the painting? They don't really know. Is it him? Is it a spirit? Is it a loved one? Not really sure. Um, what perspective did he use here? One, two, or three? Yeah, correct. One. Everything goes to one dot right there. Who are those people in the distance? We don't know. So he's trying to tell you a story. You have to put your own interpretations on it. Some people don't like that. They want it to be very literal. Some people like a mystery. They want to kind of get their own story out of it. You put your own um, thoughts on it, and you, what you make out of it is what you think. Okay, this guy is super famous. He's one of my favorites. Uh, it's pronounced Monet. Uh, since the Art Museum had a huge exhibit of his work a couple years ago, it was awesome. He is what's known, uh, again, he was around the turn of the century 100 years ago. That's him there, Claude Monet. The T is silent. I want you to know that he was an Impressionist. So you have to remember, again, 100 years ago, before that, Everything was all about realism, right? I mean, look at like Michelangelo and Da Vinci and those guys. It was all about how real can you make it? Well, people eventually kind of like wanted to get away from that. Doesn't mean they weren't good artists. Again, Picasso was an amazing realist. He just wanted to get away with that and express himself, you know, how he truly felt. So Monet was what's called an impressionist. So instead of taking six months, a year, working on an image, they would try to knock these out in like an afternoon, like two hours, three hours, usually pretty large. So this, he had a whole series known as water lilies. This is probably his most fa his famous stuff. These canvases are bigger than my projector screen. Um, like I said, the art museum here had a bunch of them, all very rare. They're all tens of millions of dollars a piece. Um, but what is the point of Impressionism? He's trying to capture the fleeting moment. He's trying to, like, you know, you've been, like, maybe on vacation, and it's, like, right at, you know, 6 o'clock when the sun's starting to go down and everything has a really cool glow to it. You know, they call it the golden hour um, in the art world. And these guys, would they would try to capture a certain 
feeling, but quickly. So they would use broad strokes of paint and just capture the quick impression of it. Um, his bridge here is a famous, he had a series of those. Um, obviously, the, I'm assuming that might be Big Ben. I'm not 100% over London. I'm not sure for, you know, he was French. I'm pretty sure he was French. Uh, but it's about capturing the fleeting moment, the impression of the moment. Got it? Monet. Um, this, oh, before I forget, let me, let me get back. This guy, if you saw, I don't know if anybody of you guys saw my Canvas post. Um, this was on Google two days ago. You guys know what a Google Doodle is, right? I think we watched a little video on that. So this was on Google Doodle. I'm like, oh, 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 that's Syrah. So it's S-E-U-R-A-T, um, pronounced Syrah. And he is known as what's a pointillist. So he uses tens of thousands of dots. And when the dots, they're certain colors, when they're next to each other, hey, Ryan, are you taking a picture of your work or what are you doing? Okay. I need you guys to focus on what I'm talking about. Okay. Thanks. Because I'm going to test you guys on this stuff. All right. So anyway, Syrah would use pointillism, tens of thousands of dots of color. How the color was laid next to each other was very important. So his most famous painting, this is not my PowerPoint, by the way. Okay. So write it down if you can't remember it. Um, it's called, I call it Sunday Afternoon in the Park. Technically, it's called Sunday Afternoon on the island of La Grande Jatte. This is in the Chicago Museum of Art. It's actually called the Art Institute of Chicago. It's a huge art museum right on the water up there in Chicago. Mr. Haters usually takes in the, the art students up there to see this on an art trip every summer. Um, this painting is huge. It's as tall it's probably as tall as the ceiling, the floor here, and it's probably as wide as the projector screen. Massive. So if you zoom in, I mean, it's tens of millions of just tiny little dots. Um, if I say, see if I can get a, a little, another example of what is pointillism. Mr. Haters does a project. Yeah, question. Um, for that particular painting, I'm not sure. You can Google that, but I mean a long time, obviously, right? Um, Mr. Haters will always do a pointless project. We did it when I was in his class. I loved it because it's just very different, but you can get very, very, very detailed. And you're literally just, some people call it stippling, but if you're just tap, 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 you're tapping rather than shading traditionally. So... Try it sometime. You know, we this is a design class. We don't really, in an art, you would do a project with this, but we don't have time for this kind of project. I just want to tell you what it is. So it's on your radar. It's called pointillism. Again, that was Saran. I thought that was cool. You know, Google Doodles, um, there's about 12 to 14 people on their crew, and they have to pick out, like, an important moment in history. Maybe it's somebody's birthday. Maybe it's, like, the start of a movement, you know, um, but it's always like a surprise. That's what I think it's really cool. It's like every day it's like a surprise. It goes out to tens of millions of people. And it's a great way to teach people history, you know. Or it might not be history. It might be something that's going on right now. Um, but they do a great job with that. I can't, it would be such a fun job. The hard part would probably be the deadlines. You know, you got to have a new one every day. And it's up for 24 hours and then it's gone. But that's what I like about it. It's like it's only up for one day. But then they take it down and then something else goes up. And they do have different artists who work on these, you know, so it's not always the same artist. Um, they do have a Google Doodle competition uh, where you get lots of money. I'm not sure when that deadline is. But anyway, let's go back to this guy. His name is Magritte. Um, he's real popular because his work, they're like little mysteries. Um, he uses a lot of symbolism in his work. Clearly, you can see, um, and if you just re just Google Magritte, you'll see a lot of like English bowler hats. He loved to put those in his paintings. Uh, let's focus on this one right here. I'm going to take a print screen of this. I'm going to go into Photoshop, and I want to know. Let me zoom out here. All right, there it is. So, what are your first? Oops, sorry. Try that again. Ah. 
Try one more time. There we go. So what are your first thoughts on this? What do you, does it mean anything to you? It's pretty literal. Like what is the bird? What kind of bird is that? Would you say? Most likely. Can you get your mask up for me young man? Thank you. Yes. Yeah, it's probably a dove. What's a, what's What's a dove usually symbolize? Peace. Anything else? Maybe the Holy Spirit. Maybe Christ himself. I mean, you know, different things. Generally, probably peace. Now, what is going on inside the bird there? Light. Daytime. What's going on outside of the bird? Yes. So light in the darkness. Maybe, to me, what it says is the light comes from within, even though there's darkness all around, right? Um, maybe. Maybe that's what he intended. Maybe it's not. But again, it's his stuff is like really, you look at it, and then it's kind of like pretty instant. You can kind of make your own interpretations. Um, if you like that kind of stuff, again, I'm encouraging you to you know, look up these guys. That was Magritte, okay? Sometimes he'll hide his face with an apple. Apples are always in his work for some reason. He's big on that. Um, next guy. Um, a lot of people's favorite. His name is Escher, M.C. Escher. His work is mostly black and white or grayscale, mostly pencil. Not always. You'll see here on the left, like, he would paint. His stuff was also like optical illusions. He loved tricking people's minds, messing with their minds. So... Everything you guys know about that I've taught you about perspective, let's look at this one here. So if you could see that one, let me zoom in on it here. Come on. Let me try that again. We'll just look at it like that. That first one, like which direction is the staircase going? It's upside down, yet it's right side up, yet it's... It's really hard to figure out. Where does it start? Where does it stop? Like, where does the staircase go to? So, that's a real thing. I think Miss Stengel had this in her classroom for a while because either this one or one of them. Um, let's look at this one down here. Where, like, these ducks, you know, the white of the sky turns into ducks, the black of the sky turns into ducks, but yet it also forms the pattern on the ground as well. Um, these patterns, like you see over here on the left, these are called tessellations. Okay, they're not in the PowerPoint. Write it down if you can't remember it. You will see it on the test. But it's called a tessellation. They do these in math, actually. They're like perfect patterns. Okay? But he would like to do, use a lot of tessellations. If you go to the mall and you go to like a frame shop or a poster, you'll probably see one of his posters. Um, this was an idea... That's what I was trying to pass on for your Christmas card. Nobody's ever done this, but maybe you have like a really cool Christmas tree with a Columbia glass ornament. Maybe there's a crucifix in the background, and you can get that in your photograph. He would do like self-portraits. That's him holding up the sphere. But I'm just trying to encourage you to kind of think differently on this Christmas card, okay? So this is Escher, and again, Tessellations. Here's one of my favorites where it's a drawing that be, that becomes real life, and then it goes back into the drawing again. Very, very uh, clever. I like how he did that. Okay, um, next guy. Probably my personal favorite of, eh, one of my favorites, but when I was younger, he definitely influenced my work. His name's Klimt. I want you to know that um, he was he used a ton of pattern he would just put pattern upon next to pattern, next to pattern, next to pattern, and a lot of gold leaf. So gold leaf is very thin sheets of gold that he would stick onto the canvas and then paint on it, around it. And his most of his paintings are like six, seven, eight feet tall. Um, I saw, I've only seen one in real life. It was overseas, and I like about lost my myself. It, it was like... My, my feet like came out from underneath. I was like, it was so luminous because he had gold leaf in his painting and it was huge. It was so cool. I can't remember if it was this one, but he was also, he would also use realism usually for just the faces. But this guy probably more than any has influenced modern 
comic book artists and graphic novelists, I will see heavy reference to this guy. He was kind of the first one to do this, where he would use all these intense geometric shapes and patterns like right next to each other, you know, to create what he was trying to create. Here's another one. His paintings are also erotic, you know, as well, but it was always about life. Um, this painting here, I believe it's called Life and Death. So you see the life over here on the right. Everybody's all huddled together. The, the baby, the infant, the man, the, the woman. There's no negative space, right? Then we have a distance here in this painting. This was very carefully thought through distance. And then obviously you see the Green Reaper over here on the left, you know, being all creepy and, and staring into the group of life people. So his, again, his stuff is very interesting. These are always people that he knew in his life that he would paint, uh, but just beautiful. And his paintings are just spectacular. Like I said, very luminescent. All right, so we get into the famous designers. I'm almost done. Um, so that's kind of like the main artists in history. There's a lot that I've missed. I'm just skimming through the top guys, the Picassos, Michelangelo's, you know, Da Vinci, all those guys. Any questions on famous artists? No questions. All right. Um, I'll probably continue tomorrow about famous artists. I'll kind of stop now, but or d designers. I've got about like five or six of the most famous designers in history. This guy is the most famous, uh, Paul Rand. He created all of these logos that they really have not changed in 50, 60 years. He created the UPS logo. If you look carefully, there's like a little gift wrap package. You probably have, maybe have never noticed that. He created the ABC logo, which they still use today. Um, Westinghouse, which is like, you know, like electric, electric bulbs and stuff like that. Yale University, Cummings Engine. Um, probably UPS, ABC, Westinghouse are his three most famous. Um, but he's probably the most famous designer ever to live. Again, logos, because he did so many famous logos, um, you know, I would say there's really like, they call them, kind of the big three of 20th century graphic design. There's Paul Rand. There's another guy called Saul Bass, which is, his work has been in modern movies, a lot of tributes to Saul Bass. And the last guy I heard, he just passed away this past year, Milton Glaser. A really, I didn't really like his work that much, but when I heard what he did, his charity that he did with it, that blew me away. We'll talk about him tomorrow. Um, but Paul Rand, again, I just want you to know, Paul Rand, be able to match him with the logo. I'm going to literally going to have a question. I'm going to say, who created the ABC logo? Was it Milton Glaser, Saul Bass, Paul Rand? It'll be multiple choice. Okay. Um, he's the first American commercial artist to embrace what's called the Swiss style of graphic design. We'll talk more about that um, later. Um, Enron, yeah, just a whole bunch. IBM, he did the IBM logo. This is Saul Bass. So his work is also super famous. He's not just responsible for many famous logos, but many famous movie posters as well. So like The Shining, that's Saul Bass. Dixie Cups, what would this one be here, this red, white, and blue one? Anybody guess? Yeah, very good. United Airlines. What You probably didn't know he did this one. What's this logo? Girl Scouts. Kleenex. What's this one right here? The W. Anybody want to guess? Very famous. Still used today. Warner Cable. Time Warner. Minolta. Cameras. You guys have seen like Cincinnati Bell and all the different bells. That's him. Quaker Oats, hugely popular, all the different versions of Quaker Oats, Quaker Bars, all that. AT&T, they still use the same exact, they haven't changed it in 50 years. I mean, maybe slightly the eight letters, but that's the exact same logo as it's always been. Um, anybody want to guess? Nobody ever gets this one. What's this one right here? It's a hand with like a rainbow or, you know, and then with the person holding their arms out in the hand. Anybody want to guess what that one is? It's a charity organization. 
Nobody? Nobody ever gets it. Yeah. Good guess. It's a good guess. It's United Way. The United Way. So, um, again, a lot of famous movie posters. We'll talk more about him tomorrow. We've got a little video we're going to watch. Anybody ever seen the movie Catch, Catch Me If You Can with Tom Hanks and Leonardo DiCaprio? What What's the movie about? Yep. Yeah, it's a real life story. It was a guy that impersonated all these different professions. So he pretended he was a doctor. And so, I mean, this, this really happened. He pretended he was a commercial airline pilot for a major airline and got away with it for like a year. He, this really happened. So this movie, Catch Me If You Can, it's got Tom Hanks, probably the biggest star in the world, Leonardo. The intro to this we'll watch tomorrow. I think we're about out of time, aren't we? About out of time. So we'll watch the intro. It's a direct tribute to Saul Bass. Direct. It's almost as if Saul Bass had done it, but they did this as a tribute to famous designer Saul Bass. Okay. So Anatomy of a Murder, you know, famous poster. They have Spike Lee. You guys have heard of Spike Lee? Spike Lee's movie Clockers was a an indirect tribute to Saul Bass's 1960s Anatomy of a Murder poster. You can see it's almost exact. There's Anatomy of a Murder from the 1960s. Here's Clockers from the, I think it was around 2000. And that was their kind of like little tip of the cap to Saul Bass. So his influence, these guys, those are like the top two. Paul Rand, Saul Bass. If you want to learn design, you got to know about those two guys. Um, I'll just go till the end here. The bell's going to ring. Milton Glaser, again, he was 89. He just passed away recently. I know you guys have seen the I Love New York, right? What I didn't know is how cool the story is. So in the 70s, New York City was really kind of sketchy and dirty and gross, and they were like a lot of the tourism was way down, and they were losing lots of money, a lot of tourism dollars. So he is from New York, um, loved New York. So the story goes, he was in a, and he really wanted to help New York City get out of this. And he wasn't a politician. He was a graphic designer. But he wanted to come up with an idea, how can I help the city out? What can I do as a designer? So he was in a cab, and he pulled out a napkin out of his pocket, and he had this little doodle, I love New York. And instead of the word love, he just had a simple heart. And then he presented it to the city. They loved it. And then he's like, let's make bumper stickers of this. So this took off. I can't remember how many millions of dollars it made. He donated his work to the city. He himself could have made tens of millions of dollars off of this. He donated it. How cool is that? So I always, like, I don't necessarily really, it's not that great of a design in my opinion. It's very simple. Again, less is more. You don't get any less than this. It's just literally I heart. But, I mean, it's been around since the 70s. And they still use it for I love whatever. That's all. Again, he's he's done other stuff. He's done movie posters. He's done actually a lot of music, uh, like album covers for like Bob Dylan. That's one of his. And he had a very unique illustration style, but he will be forever known for the I Love New York and how he helped. And it totally did help New York get out of its its economic funk. And he was a big reason for that. People would wear I Love New York t-shirts. They would put the I Love New York bumper stickers on their cars. I mean, it was internationally known. Just something so simple. You know, this is before the internet. Keep that in mind. So design can be very powerful. You just have to be creative in how you use it. Okay, we'll just kind of stop with Milton Glaser. you have any questions about any of those guys? All right, cool. Thanks for listening. I usually don't lecture this long about this stuff, but thought it was very important. So thanks for listening.